Let's pray. We're going to jump into this word. I'm going to get a little personal, a little vulnerable in it as we dive into finances uh, and just let you guys all know the true inner workings of my incredible stock picks and my fabulous financial superiority uh, so that you know that it's okay to listen to me today, okay? Father, we thank you for your word and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to receive it. Well, Lord, let it bring change in our life or the change that you know that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've been going through six areas of personal wholeness, and this Sunday we're diving into finances. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, buckle your seatbelt. Get ready for 40 minutes of preaching on tithing, praise God. No, we're not going to do that, but we're going to dive into wholeness in finances, bigger picture of finances. And whether you are a teenager... Okay, or you're in retirement, this applies to you. Okay, if you're working at Chick-fil-A, okay, or if you're already done with all of that and you're just on Sundays watching NASCAR or whatever you're going to do now because you're retired, this is going to apply to you, okay? So be ready, be open, okay, as we dive in. So just a recap, six areas of personal wholeness. Here's the, the red wheel uh, of personal wholeness, and it's got some different... Uh, shapes in there. And what we did the first when we started this series is that we took these different categories and we rated ourselves from zero to 10 on mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, uh, financial, and physical health. And basically when we did that, zero is at the bottom, 10 is at the top. You rate yourself and you color it in. And when you're all done, you get a shape. And then the question is, when you look at your shape, is will it roll? Will it roll? So if your shape will not roll, then that gives kind of an explanation of why, like, it seems like life is going well, and then all of a sudden, bam, you just get stuck. It's like, I feel like I got a flat tire, like I went off the road, like I got stuck in a ditch. I don't understand why things aren't doing well now, because I was doing really good with my relationships, I was doing really good with my spiritual time, and and praying, and reading the Word, being close to God. I was doing really good in all these areas, and then the end of the month came, and I had to pay bills, Okay, and then all of a sudden, eh, my relationships are a wreck because of all the stress and all these things are going on. And so they all interrelate. Okay, and that's the point, is that everything interrelates. Everything comes together, and we're looking at wholeness in our faith, wholeness in our walk with God. And today is finances. So a couple of stories uh, from our own lives. Um, one is, is, I believe strongly, and the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God. And everything else will be added to you. Amen? Amen? I believe that. And when I believe something, I live it. And so I said, Lord, that's it. I believe it. I'm living it. And so I started serving and serving and serving. This was back in Washington. So this is a couple of states ago in our life journey. And I was doing it. My wife would come and say, honey, we got to pay bills. And I said, well, I know we got to pay bills, but... Seek first the kingdom, everything else will be added. And I was serving at the church and working at the church and volunteering at the church and outreaching at the church. I was doing everything I could do at the church. And she'd come and say, honey, we can't, we got like, we need some money. We got to buy food and stuff. Like, we need some money. Seek first the kingdom, everything's going to be added. Praise God. One day we have an argument. I I was a real estate agent and real estate agents, uh, praise God, can make a lot of money. Um, Praise God, most of them don't. They actually, most of them are actually below the poverty line. Because why? It's a self-driven job. You have to get out there and work. You have to find your people. You have to make the sales. You don't just have to just kind of sit back. And so it can be a a tough job if you're not fully motivated on the job. And I wasn't fully motivated on the job because I was seeking first the kingdom. All faith. And praising God. He's going to bless us. Don't worry, honey. I know the account looks empty, but when you open it tomorrow, bam! The Lord will have deposited into our account. All the stuff. And so I'm believing that. Well, it keeps it lower and lower. I had a beautiful Chrysler 300, all leather, the moonroof. I love moonroofs. I never open them. And in Texas, I don't even open the little thing that blocks them out from the sun because it's too hot on my bald head. But I just love having them. I just want it. Like, that's my favorite thing. Of all the things in the world you could want, I just love that. I probably, I saw Jurassic Park when I was a kid, and they had these SUVs with these big sunroofs and stuff. And so probably that's why. Uh, but I love them. And so I have it. This thing's amazing. Beautiful, shiny wheels, it cruises. And she comes in, she's like, you're using all of our gas going to the church to all these events and stuff, and you're not making any money. Like, I need this for real estate. She's like, you know my wife, she knows how to say things in such a graceful way. 
She's like, you're not even selling any real estate. <laughs> you're not doing real estate. I'm like, I'm a realtor. No, you're not. So, okay. So we have an argument, right? Which you can imagine from that point on got a little heated. And we exchanged some views aggressively. <laughs> and she left. Not in peace. She just left. Well, I wasn't in peace either. So I said, you know what? I'll show you. Because she's like, this thing eats too much gas. I said, that's fine. So she was only gone like four hours. By the time she got home, I had sold my Chrysler 300, gone. And she walks in the door, and she's like, where's your car? I'm like, it's on the way. She's like, what do you mean it's on the way? I said, it's gone. Don't you worry. I've taken care of our gas mileage problems. Don't you worry. So about an hour or so later, it's dinner time. And somebody pulls up in their little Toyota Camry. And she's like, this your new car? I'm like, no. They open the trunk, and inside the trunk is my new car. It's a little uh, moped that's all in a just teeny tiny little moped stuffed in a trunk. <laughs> and she pulls this thing out, brings it up to the front door, and this was my $700 vehicle. So I took all the cash from my car, I handed it to my wife, said, here's some cash to get you by for a while. And this car gets 99 miles a gallon. <laughs> And back then in Washington, gas was already $4, so it was about, well, it was like three fifty. dollars So basically, it took me a gallon to fill it, so just under $4 to fill it, and I could drive it for two weeks. And I'm like, there you go. I've solved our problems. The only thing I didn't think about was that it was October, and we were living in Washington, which is all rain and freezing cold temperatures and terrible. And so I'm driving this thing around in Washington, and this is not like one of these, like, ones that you can like cruise on this thing like top like pulled back just fired up downhill the wind behind my back could hit like 35 and I'm out here just I'm going pouring down rain I'm soaked it's just awful freezing cold we're getting to October November it's getting colder and colder and I'm regretting it more and more and finally one friend of mine says man you need some gear and I'm like yeah I need some gear and he's like, I've got some gear. He goes, i got like $600 motorcycle gear. He says, it's, I don't need it anymore. You can have it. So he gives me full motorcycle gear. Gear. I've got this huge helmet. I've got the full gear. It's got the crash pads built into it, everything. And I get on my moped in this. <laughs> the problem is he was a 2X. So I'm in 2X motorcycle gear, and I'm barely an X. And uh, I'm barely an L. And i got a 2XL. And really, probably a medium-ish, just between a medium and a large would have been good. And I'm in this thing, and it is stuffed. I mean, I can barely sit down. I'm just fully in gear and looking around. And so I would pull into the church, and I'd, you know, I'd drive down the road, and I'd get to the church. I'd go inside, and then I'd walk into the lobby. I'm covered in rain and soap. And I'd have to sit and, like, take all this off, which takes a while to get out of. So it's really, really stroked my ego every time I walked into the church. And everybody's like, nice moped. So I had that all winter. Because I was going to prove that God provides. And he kind of did, in a way, I guess. Uh, not in the way that you would think, that I'm serving God. Lord, I'm doing your work. I'm loving you. Like, you should give me, like, an awesome car, and you should give me a bigger house, and give me more money, and provide. It didn't work like that. We made our bills and stuff, and God watched over us. But that was one. You guys have heard the uh, bring your own toilet paper friends wanted to come over for dinner. We had no money. We had no food. They'd call us up before COVID. In COVID, I, we would definitely would have had them bring their own toilet paper for a while. So calls up, says, hey, uh, you know, is there anything we can bring? I said, yeah, bring toilet paper. We're totally out. So they literally had to bring toilet paper just to come have dinner at our house. So I know what it is to be, like, financially tight. Okay? And so I'm not sharing this from, like, oh, boy, well, yeah, it's easy to say if you've got a lot of money. It's easy to say if you can this and that. No, I, we have had no money. We, most of our lives, have had no money. Now, we've had little little peaks in there where, oh, look, we're rich, and then it's gone, okay? That's the life of an entrepreneur. You're never settled. So anytime that you think you've, like, made it, you're like, oh, great, we should double down. <laughs> yeah, we're doubling down, <laughs> way down. We're going down, down. It's like, we had so much. I know, but we're on the way to better mountains. So I like the mountain we are on. So I speak from experience. Uh, one last story, and I'm going to jump into this word. We had furniture stores, and we were in Bend, and it was a disaster for a while, before it took off and did really good. But at first, it was a total disaster and totally stressful. And we couldn't make any money. 
And I was still doing the same thing. I'm going to serve God first, serve God first. So I went and led this guy in a Bible study as a one-on-one -on -one devotional. And we're doing the Bible study. And meanwhile, I'm stressing out because I can't really hardly pay my bills. And when I say can't hardly, I mean like I didn't have much credit cards left. That's the hardly part of it. Because okay? I was just using credit cards. And I'm like, we're going to make it. We're going to turn around. And so we're doing this. And I'm sitting there. And I go to meet this guy. And then afterwards, I pull up to the furniture store in a big, ugly truck with broken brakes. And all this stuff's going on. I sit there, and I'm like, just trying to unstress. Cause now i got to go in and work, and working doesn't actually make me money. I lose money every day I open the shop at the time. And I'm like, Lord, I don't care if we lose everything. I'm going to keep on doing Bible studies with guys and helping them out, because I'm going to seek first the kingdom. I'm going to be faithful. And I turn, and this brand-new BMW pulls in, still has the dealer plates on it, the stickers, the window things. I'm like, Oh my gosh, money is rolling into our store. And it rolls in, parks, gets out of the car. This lady steps out, and I'm like, thank you, God. I'm like, yes, devil, take that. I Bible studied, and the money's coming in. And then the wind blows. Like, not the spirit, but the actual wind <laughs> blows. <laughs> Boom. And there's a box spring that I had, because we were furniture store. I was out on the porch waiting for pickup. And the wind comes behind the box spring, picks it up, and throws it down on the lady's hood. Bam. And all I hear is screaming, ah! And I look out the window, and like any good man of faith, I shut my door, I rolled up the window, and leaned back in my seat, <laughs> and waited for my wife to hear her screaming, and Matt Watts, who was working with us at the time, to hear her screaming, and to come out and help her because I was not getting out of the car. I'm like, that, that's too much for me, Lord. I'm done. And so we had to take care of it, and we dented her car, and everything had to get fixed up, and I'm just like, Lord. So I have had this ongoing struggle and battle between faith and finances, like, my whole life. And there's been times where God's done amazing things and opened doors of opportunity, and our furniture stores grew, and we had, you know, bunch of people working for us, a couple of locations, a big warehouse, and I mean, everything was growing and working. So in the end, I mean, God worked it through, gave wisdom and direction and instruction, but it wasn't just because we had faith and woke up. We had to apply and do things in it. We had to get disciplined and get smarter and learn what we're doing, and, and in that, God, through faith, also worked things through, but there's a combo that happens. But money and finances and faith do weird things to us, and they cause us to make all kinds of weird decisions sometimes, and uh, sometimes it's almost like we lose money at, you know, on a bet, and we're like, you know, I'm just going to put more on it. So we gave, and things didn't work out. Our finances are broke, so we're going to solve that. But, you know, what? I'm going to give twice as much. I love you to give. Our church needs money because we're a church. Churches need money. But you don't just give your way out of stuff, okay? There's actual financial wisdom, and there's things that God puts in your life to do. And so if you are struggling, hear this whole word. And if you're not generous, hear that too because God's going to call you to give. Okay, but we're looking at the whole picture. So we're first going to jump in on psychology. Psychology Today, this is a, a quote from one of their articles. They do a bunch of studies on different things and, and present studies. But this one, money is about emotion and is one of the most powerful emotional triggers in our lives. Money is close to the heart. For some, it's a trigger to their anger because it takes a lot of time and effort to get it. Anybody ever get frustrated or angry around money? Any stress? A lot of marriages dissolve around money because that's where the fight happens and the anger comes out. Well, why? It's just money. It's just money. Like, what's it? like money isn't everything, right? But yet it triggers so many things. And it says in this quote, it says, it's because it's an emotional trigger because it is close to the heart. Okay? Well, where have we heard that before? Well, as believers, we can go to Matthew and we can listen to Jesus. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So Jesus actually, way before psychology today, way before people did a bunch of studies, Jesus said, you know what, where your heart is, is your treasure. In other words, your money, your treasure is what? It's close to your heart. Like Jesus already identified that. He already pointed that out. So they could have saved time and money on studies and just read the Bible and said, oh, look, it's close to your heart. 
Like this is thousands of years old. Like this is close to the heart. This is why the Bible talks so much about money. This is why it gets so far into uh, finances. And Jesus talks about money, which he does actually a lot. But what's the purpose of money? How should we relate to it? How should we use it? Anybody want to take a stab at that? What's the purpose of money? To frustrate me. To make sure I'm a slave to the man the rest of my life. No. Well, tips are to ensure that you get good service, right? At least they used to be. Now tips are just expected. And if you don't give good tips, you're going to get extra bad service, right? So money used to be motivated that way. But here's some things that money actually functions for. The purpose of money is, first of all, it reveals our heart and expresses our heart. That's what it does. It reveals and expresses what's inside of us. But money allows us to exchange value across the street and across countries. It actually allows us to exchange value. You have something of value, whether it's something that you have that is a skill, whether it's a product, whether it's a, 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 something that you know how to teach or do. Uh, you have something you can actually trade value. You know, you, if somebody's a really good listener, that's a value. And you know, people will say, do you know what? I value that, so I will give you some money to listen to me. I'll give you some money to just sit and listen. Every mom wishes they could charge their kids, right? Like, you know what, you're... Are we officially starting your talking and telling me all your stories and problems? Because I'm about to start the clock. Okay, I'm taking some money in. But when you listen, right, that is, a, that is a value. All these different things are value. Well, how do you trade for that? Well, money allows us to do that. When it's treated right and treated fairly, and people are actually charging a fair price, and people are giving a fair value, it actually is something that brings community together. It causes somebody to be able to offer something and feel like, you know what, you appreciate me because you're giving me some value for that. And then also for the other person to appreciate what they received. Thank you for, for giving me what you made. Thank you for putting this together and, and allowing me to be blessed by it. So it actually brings people together. And the cool thing about that, just the way that it works, is that it brings people together all over the world. It brings them together regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of anything, because they're trading things of value and it actually is something that can cause unity, even though what we mostly hear about it is that it's divisive and it's about putting people down and class warfare and all these things. There's actually a, used in the right way, there's actually a, a social value and a cultural value to finances. It also uh, expresses our heart toward God. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. If we're generous towards God, we're generous towards giving, giving to the church, giving to others, giving to people that are serving in ministry areas. It shows a heart of love towards God and towards his work. It is our heart towards people. I see somebody's need. I say, well, I'm really sorry about that. Well, when we actually then dig in our pocket and do something to help the person, right, it communicates that we actually care about them, right? Christmas is that way. I say, well, it's not about the gift. Well, it kind of is. Because who do you give the best gift to? Do you give it to your spouse? Or do you give it to someone else's spouse? You give it to yours, hopefully. Otherwise, we've got other conversations we need to have, and you can meet me in my office after service. But usually you give the best gift to the person closest to you, right? So the gift actually does communicate value. It does communi communicate care and love. So when we give stuff to somebody, something that costs us money, costs us effort, then we're trading a value, and then we give to them. We say, you know what, here, you are someone I appreciate. I'm giving this to you. So it has a lot of different uses and values. Now the question is, how do you personally relate to money? Do you love it or hate it? I know somebody said, man, I hate money. I just hate it. But I know I'm going to have to work for it the rest of my life and deal with it, so i got to figure out how to work with it and deal with it. But in turn, they hate it. It just causes stress and strife and frustration in their life. And they're just like, man, if I could just forget about money, I wouldn't even have to worry about it. I could just live my life. But it's so stressful, and I just hate it. Well, then maybe that's you. Maybe you love money. In 1 Timothy 6.10, now this is, a, this is a verse that's probably one of the most, quoted, uh, most misquoted verses in the Bible. You'll often hear that money is the root of all evil. Who's ever heard that before? Okay, that's not true. It's not biblical, it's not true. Okay, the actual verse says the love of money is the root of evil. Not money, the love of money is actually the root of evil. And so love in that context, what it's talking about, the actual word, what it means is like a covetousness and a deep desire. I've got to have this. 
But when you have a covetousness and a deep desire, like I love, I want, I need, think of Lord of the My precious. Just think of Gollum who, who has to have that ring. Like, my precious. I gotta have it. When you have this love and this desire, I need money. Well, how much do you have? I need more. They asked a guy once, he's the richest man in the world at the time, it was one of the Rockefellers, and they said, How much money is enough? And he said, Just a little bit more. That's the problem. It's always just a little bit more. If I had a little bigger house, a little nicer car, if my moped could go 45 instead of 35, then I'd be happy. But it's just never quite enough. It's the love of money. It causes us to do all kinds of things. It causes us to cheat, to lie, to steal, to take advantage of someone, to be angry at someone else because they got the promotion instead of us because that promotion came with a little bit more money. It's the love of it. It's that deep deep desire for it that's the problem. Genesis 12, 2 tells us that we're actually blessed to be a blessing. In other words, money comes in. God was speaking to Abraham, but we're all, the Bible says, children of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was the father of faith, of believing God. And so we're all a part of that. And so we have this ability to believe God and have faith. Well, he's told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And so then you can turn around and be a blessing to others and pour that out. And so we should not hate money. We should not love money. Okay? But we should love people. And so receiving money should be a blessing because we understand, you know, I can take that money and I can give it out and I can use it to be a blessing to my family first and to others as well. Is money a source of worry or peace for you? Like if you took all your thoughts about money and you put them on a scale, worry, peace, worry, peace, which way would your scale tip? way would it go? Because where God wants you to be, we're talking about wholeness, completeness, is that he actually wants money for you to be a place where when you think of money, the emotion, there's a wheel tying an emotion, and the thoughts are mine that come would be peace. I'm at peace. I'm going to think about my finances so that I could be at peace today. How many of you, that's like how you meditate for peace? Right? Well, I'm really stressed out about this. I just need to sit and think on my finances for a minute. <sighs> that feels good. Let me print my budget off. <sighs> Let me think about even writing a budget. <sighs> wow, it's amazing. This is peace. Maybe that's not you. But that is where we should be because Jesus says in Matthew, he says, don't worry about what you'll wear. Don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink. Don't worry about any of these things. Why? Because our Heavenly Father already knows that you need them, and He's already going to take care of you. So uh, unlike the world that doesn't know God, or unlike you before you came to know God, you are now in a position of knowing that your Father has promised to take care of you, which means you're kind of now living or playing with house money, as they say. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I don't have to stress and worry about this. When I was dealing heavily with, with different financial fears and worries and stuff like that, and I was stressed out, and the Lord was telling me, you know, I was reading this verse, and he's like, I'm like, I understand that, Lord, but I don't have that much money. Like, I'm barely making it. Like, I need money for this, Lord. And just really clearly in my prayer time, he said, would it help if you held it? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, like, if you held it, would you feel better? I'm like, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. He's like, okay. You go somewhere with your son. You say, okay, we're going to go have lunch. If the whole drive there, he's saying, do we have enough money? Do we have enough money? I don't have any money. Do we have enough money? What would you tell him? I'd say, son, I'm buying lunch. And if he kept on saying, well, I know, but I don't have any money. He's like, son, I'm buying lunch. He's like, well, I know, but, but, but. At what point would it just start to offend me as a dad to be like, dude, chill out. Like, have I ever not fed you before? Anybody ever told their kids that? Huh? Have I ever not fed you before? I take care of you. Well, at what point, God's like, well, would it help if I stuck all the money in your account? Then you'd feel better? Or is it okay if I hold it and I give it to you when we get places that you need it? We get to seasons that you need it. 
There's things going on that you need it. Like, is that okay? I'm like, okay, fine, that's okay. But can I hold a little? How much would you like to hold? Just a little more. Please, just a little more. But knowing that he's taking care of me allows me to say, do you know what, I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to stress about it. Can I walk in that kind of peace? Can you walk in that kind of peace? Greed or contentment. Godliness with contentment is a great gain. It tells us that in 1 Timothy 6. Do you always need more? Do you need the better phone? Do you need the better watch? Do you need the better car? Do you need the better this? When you go to the movie, do you have to upgrade to the extra triple XD box that shakes when you sit in it? Otherwise, it's not even quite the full experience. Like, so always, I got to just have something else. I heard that person has that. I heard that person has this, but I don't have that. I need it. You know, well, I know I can get that pair of shoes right there, and it's the same price as that pair of shoes. But that pair of shoes over there is way better. Is it really? So contentment is allowed to be being able to say, okay, this is enough. Like, this is good enough. There's a poem that talks about, you know, this guy that was mad that he had no shoes until he met a man that had no feet. Right? It's like, everything is perspective. Right? Can you look at what you have and just say, Lord, thank you. Like, I have this right now, and I appreciate this. I'm thankful for this. But I don't have hardly anything. But there's people who don't even have life right now. They literally passed away just in the last, we all know somebody passed away in the last year or two. Gone. You can be thankful that you're here. That you have an opportunity maybe later to get something else. There's contentment. There's a peace about it. Or else are you greedy and you always need more? Do you hoard or are you generous? Hoarding is different than being greedy. It sounds the same, but it's different. Because greedy is you just, it's just consumption. A hoarding is, well, it's safety. It's protection. I just need a bunch in case something happens. Like, it's not about me having the best. It's just, I just make sure I have enough. That something doesn't happen. Generosity giving out is this trust that if I give out, that God will bless that and take care of me. It's okay for me to give. Because I'm not stressed and worried that I have to cover everything all the time and have this many years. Have some savings. Just have some retirement. Have some things. But do I need this much? Because in the meantime, some of this could be being used to extend God's kingdom, to reach hurting people, to help others to be generous and so there's a balance that comes in are you indebted or are you debt free the bible talks about this it says to be in debt in romans 13 8 it says be indebted to no one except for in the debt of love their only debt to other people should be that i owe love to you why do you owe love to them what did they ever do for you god made them that's just enough So now we owe the Lord our whole lives, our whole person, our whole being. And so anyone that he's made and loves, we have a debt that we owe them of love. Like, I'm paying you love out on God's behalf. God wants to love you. I'm here to do that. That we love each other. But other debt we shouldn't have. Well, but I have some. Now what do I do? Well, don't panic. It's still there. It might still be there for a while. But you want to work towards getting rid of debt, not piling it up. Okay, so these are just concepts, okay, of how we relate to money, okay, but I'm going to talk about four, what I think are four keys to actually doing money God's way, okay, number one is to work with diligence, work with diligence, well, I go to work every day, I'm not talking about that, work with diligence, work as if the job that you do is a job that God gave you and that God wants you to work in, Not the job that you want to get out of. Not the job that's beneath you. Not the job that, oh, I just have to walk in every day. Get rid of all of that and walk into your job, whatever it might be, and work that job with diligence. A couple of misconceptions about work. One, people think that work is a curse. Someday I'm going to retire. Someday I'm going to get set free from all this. Because right now work is a curse. That's not biblical, for one. The Bible doesn't actually talk about retirement. I'm not saying you shouldn't retire, but that's not a goal. We're here to do what Genesis, the Bible tells us, to actually what God's purpose for our life was. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. That's all work. Go and do stuff that produces value, that produces goodness. 
that extends my goodness in the world. Go work. Fill the earth, subdue it. The subduing is working. We're meant to work. We're not meant to overwork, but we are meant to work. We're meant to get up in the morning and go put work in. The Bible says in Proverbs that the hand of the diligent will rule. The hand of the lazy will come to slave labor. If you go to work and you're lazy there because it's beneath you or the other person's got a better thing than you or because I don't like my manager or because, whatever reason it might be, guess what? You are going to wind up always being ruled over. You won't get promoted. You won't find... I know, but they never see me anyways. God's the one who sees. God's the one who promotes. God's the one who rewards. Joseph was promoted and rewarded right out of a dungeon up to the number two man in all of Egypt. Well, that's a long time ago. It happens now. All the time. I always talk to people and they're working a job they don't even like and they're working it and they're working hard and all of a sudden somebody sees them, they stick out as somebody that has motivation and that cares and all of a sudden they get promoted. My own daughter now, she has a position at Target that there's only one person in each store. They're not even managed by the managers. They're managed by an outside person that manages them and their job is to make sure the entire store is staged for selling. They're the only person on that team and they're not even a part of the normal Target. They're totally managed by somebody else. Do you know how she got that job? She was working at a retail store down at the domain. And it was an okay job, but it wasn't a life job. It wasn't even a career job. Didn't make that much money there. But she treated it like it was the job that God gave her. And she just would show up there. And the men that she walked in the door, love on everybody, beam, be happy, help them. And somebody was getting served by her one day. And then came back and said, you know what? I'm actually a scout for other jobs. And I was just going through the different stores here, seeing how people help me. And said, would you like to meet up and talk about a better job. That's how she ends up where she's at. You don't know what will happen as God sees your work, but his promise is that the hand of the diligent will rule. It also talks about see a man skilled, and this is also in Proverbs, see a man skilled in his labor, he will serve before kings and not ordinary men. That applies for men and women. He's talking about humanity, people that are working. Someone skilled, they'll serve before kings and not ordinary men. You will find your promotion. You will get moved forward. God will reward your work. Okay, but that's first of all, you have to go in there and work. You have to go in there and do the job. Number two, give with generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So if you give a little, only a little comes back. If you give more, more comes back. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not because you have to, not because you regret it, not because you don't, oh, I guess i got to give money, but give it not from compulsion. Okay, not reluctantly. Okay, but God loves a cheerful giver. When God sees somebody giving from their stuff to support his work or to support others in need, God looks down and he doesn't just look at the act. He looks at what's motivating the act because if they're doing it out of compulsion or doing it for the wrong reason, he looks down and he's like, okay, good, I'm getting the money where it's supposed to go. But I don't love that. You're just doing it. Can you do it with a smile? Go wash the dishes. Fine. Clank, clank, bang, bang. Hey, can you do it like you like living here? Can you do it like you're thankful that we make you dinner? Can you do it like you're thankful that you have a roof over your head? Can you do it like you love it? I love it. I love doing this. Something about the way it's done matters. And God's saying, do you know what? Become someone that sows generously and loves to do it cheerfully. And when I see that, I love it. That's how we please God. We please God by giving generously and joyfully. It says, and then God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So when you do that and you give out generously with the right heart, God looks down and loves it. He pours more into your life, but not just money. It says all things. So when you're talking about the six areas of wholeness that we've been talking about, he pours more emotional well-being into your heart, more mental well-being into your heart. All these things, it starts to pour in. You have less stress because you're ex experiencing the joy of giving. It's better to give than receive. You're experiencing that less stress, which means your physical body benefits. Your whole person begins to benefit. 
Say, well, I've been giving and stuff in my, my bank. I haven't gotten a raise yet or some big bonus check come through or anything else. No, take your mind off of that. And you're just giving generously. You realize my whole life is actually just starting to feel better. My wheel's rounding out. God's blessing me. These are coming. And then it says, as he does that, you have everything that you need, so quit worrying. But then here's the cool part. So you will abound in every good work. The purpose he's pouring more back in is, guess what? So you can do the same thing again and start pumping stuff back out to bless and help people. Then he pours more back in. And then, oh, this feels great. It's amazing. And guess what we do? We pour more back out. And it's a cycle that keeps us alive. It's almost like our lungs breathing. It keeps us emotionally and mentally and financially healthy. It's coming in. It's going out. It's coming in. Number three, spend with contentment. It's okay to spend money. One of my kids is making money, making a lot of money for her age, putting it all away. But boy, she hates to spend it right now. So it's gotten to be a real stress for her. Something she needs or something she wants, but she's going to spend it. And so she's learning to, like, spend it. And then she's going on a vacation. She's like, with a friend, she's like, but i got to spend my money. But you also want to have fun and have a good time. But i got to spend my back and forth, back and forth. She's wrestling that out. It's not easy to do, to be able to spend and also be able to save and be able to find this balance. I'm not saying it's easy. It's something to work on and work towards. But the idea is that we can spend and be content. I spent, and I'm content with what I received, but I'm also content that the money is now gone. I'm not going to regret it for the next week and worry about it. It's gone. I spent it. I'm going to breathe and believe that God's taking care of me, and I'm okay. And so there's a whole contentment that goes. This is 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So to live after God, to model our life after God, to walk in faith and spirituality is very good when it comes with contentment. Now we've gained so much. For we brought, now here's the, okay, this is an easy verse to blow by. But just picture yourself. For Everybody close your eyes. Okay, right now, picture, just close your eyes. It's going to be a very deep psychological, emotional experience you're about to walk through, okay? Picture yourself as a baby. Okay? Just popped out of the womb. You had nothing on. Got it? Okay, stay there. Don't leave it. Now, instantly, as fast as you can, picture yourself today curled up in the same position, leaving this world to higher places, and you got nothing on. Just do, whoa. It's better or worse, I have no idea. But that's how you're going to leave. You can't say that in church. Listen, I'm about to read it in church. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. That is not some theological big statement. That's just a simple fact. You came in like that, and you're going to leave like that. Everything you've worked your whole life for is going to be gone. And the people that you leave it to, if you're leaving it to someone, they may not use it well. They may blow through it and burn it up. And guess what? They might even use it on things that are totally against your values. So your money may go to promote things that you totally would stand against. You have no idea. When you leave, there's nothing that you can take. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So we have needs while we're in this world. And we have opportunities to be a blessing while we're in this world. But once we leave, it's gone. So the constant worry, stress, fretting, striving, all over money, it doesn't do us any good. Because we already know we're cared for. We already know we're loved. And God just wants us to take it and receive it, not as what gives us life, because we already have life from him, 
but receive it as what it is. It's a blessing and a tool to make our lives and the lives of those around us better, to show how we love God through it and to show how we love each other through it. I have money, I'm going to use it to bless God, I'm going to use it to bless you. And so I'm using it in these ways. And the last one is to trust God completely. Matthew 6, 25 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or, or, about your, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Not by planning. Can you plan? Can you do things like that that make your life last longer? Yes. You can plan for your health. You can plan for your finances. You can plan for it. There's a lot of things you can do that plan that actually, even studies and everything showed that they actually can actually extend your lifespan. But it didn't say that. It said worrying, stressing, being burdened by. Those things actually are proven to actually reduce our lifespan because stress causes all kinds of things to go in our body that cause inflammation, that cause disease and, and heart failure and all types of stuff. So it's the not worrying. Planning is good. Worrying is actually harmful. And it says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If you don't know Solomon, he was a, a king. The Bible talks about was the richest man, the wisest man in the world. But even he was not clothed like those. And it says, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, talking about people who don't follow God, they don't know God, they run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what does it mean to seek first the kingdom? Well, let's say this. This is where I had it wrong. I thought seek first the kingdom only meant that I'm just going to keep doing things that look spiritual. Keep doing things that are for the church or for something. This is, this is seek the kingdom. That's not seek the kingdom. The kingdom, a kingdom is defined by where a king has rulership and reign. That's what makes it a kingdom. This is my place where I rule and reign. And so my rules apply here. My way of doing life applies here. If I want to charge taxes, there's taxes. If I want us to farm this type of stuff, we farm it. Like, this is where if somebody invades here, I protect it. This is my kingdom. So the kingdom of God, the Bible talks about this, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is living the way, righteously, living the way that God calls us to live, not just with serving in the church, but how do I serve my family? Well, I had that out of balance because well, I'm going to the church to serve. Well, that's, that's great, but I wasn't serving my family. Yet in God's kingdom, righteousness talks about serving and taking care of your family. It even says if someone doesn't provide for their own family, they're worse than an unbeliever. Why? Because we know God, we know his love, we know how he cares for family, but we refuse to do it ourselves. And so looking at my life, is my life lining up with the kingdom of God? In each area am I doing this? That's seeking first the, the kingdom of God. Is his rule and reign working in all the areas of my life? Which can include volunteering and being at church and being involved with that. So I'm going to close with these last couple of quotes, and then we're going to be done. I'm going to share one study. Diligence, generosity, contentment. That's the things that we just talked about. And trust, they break down the bondage of financial anxiety and the cycle of poverty. It breaks those things down. Why? The right relationship with money leads to better emotions, which leads to better financial decisions. When you're living under stress and worry, or you're making bad decisions all the time, and you're not operating right, your mind is in fight or flight. Going back to what we talked about about the mind, guess what your mind does in fight or flight? It shuts down the ability to reason, because it just wants you to act. So when you allow yourself to go into that place of, fly, of fight or flight, because you're worrying, stressing, not taking care of finances properly, then you start to make worse and worse decisions. And so the cycle just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And then the fear and the worry comes in. And the fear and the worry creates more fight or flight, which then shuts down your brain, which then keeps you from being able to make money. It becomes a cycle. 
And when somebody lives in a cycle of poverty, this type of cycle, this is part of what's, what's actually propelling it. So to step back from all that and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to actually just work diligently. I'm going to give generously. I'm going to be content. I'm going to trust you. We're bringing ourselves back to a place of peace where our mind can actually start to work right again and use reason and we make better financial decisions which move our life forward. And so that's the place that we want to get to. There was a study at UC uh, Berkeley. It's the Greater Good Science Center. And it says, giving of our time, energy, and money all promote greater happiness and feelings of well-being than receiving them. They did a whole study on this. Again, where did we hear that before? We heard that in the Bible. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have ministered to my own needs and those of my companions. So Paul was working on his own, serving himself and others. And it says, in everything I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. And then he says, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So there's a whole process where God wants to take us through to where we become generous. But it's through hard work and actually doing a good job. God promotes and builds our life. And then we become generous. We're content in our lives. And then we actually trust God and don't have the worry dominating our lives on finances. That's not a place for one person to be. That's a place for all of us to be. There's different methods. But these are the principles it's different, well, I can get this guy does this study and this guy does this, and I can get a part of financial peace, or I can get a part of this one or that one or this one. There's different methods, but these are the principles that you want to apply in your life to begin to work that through and to be able to operate from a place of peace. So I'm going to close this in prayer. On the screen, uh, let's put up the uh, QR code. I'm going to jump to there. And uh, the Bible reading plan this week is about financial peace. It's about finding peace. Uh, financial wholeness in your life. So if you didn't scan that earlier, uh, feel free to scan it now. Um, I'm just going to pray over you. If you need help at all in this area, you're like, man, I just, I, I got that. I, my finances are really struggling and you really need help. You know, please jump online and just email the church. You can find our email on the, on the website. Just email the church and say, hey, I'd like to meet with somebody. Like, I just feel too overwhelmed by this. I'd like to meet with somebody. God wants your finances to be in a place of wholeness and peace. Hey, my marriage is really struggling because of our finances. Just stop. Don't try to keep doing it on your own. Just say, hey, can somebody sit down with us and help us? Can somebody talk me through it on how to do this? Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. It's just a part of life. We talk about mental health. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed if you've got something going on. Get help. Okay, don't be embarrassed or ashamed if you've got financial issues going on. Just get help. God wants you to be whole in this area. Father, we thank you for your word, and we just pray, Lord, that each person who's here Lord, would receive from this what you wanted them to receive. God, I ask that their life would begin to uh, Lord, move forward in wholeness in this area. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.